Um, yeah, and I particularly. All right, we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time, and hopefully, uh, we'll have some more people joining us. Uh, so, hello, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt McComas, and I'm the Senior Program Manager at Johns Hopkins 21st Century Cities Initiative. We're an urban research center at Hopkins that focuses on issues of economic growth and quality of life in Baltimore and uh, cities around the world. And today, we're happy to be co-hosting this event with the Hopkins Population Center, as it fits our mission of bringing top scholars from around the world to discuss their urban research in an interdisciplinary setting. We had originally uh, planned this to be an in-person event, but uh, the world had other plans. So we're thankful that all of you are still able to join us um, remotely. Uh, so our agenda today, uh, we're gonna start off with um, about a 45 minute presentation from Professor Gagne, uh, followed by 15 minutes for questions. And uh, for questions during the presentation, please use the chat box feature to enter your questions and then I'll call on you and uh, give you the opportunity to um, ask them at the end. Uh, so with that, I wanna hand it off to Emily Agree, who is a research professor in the departments of sociology and population, family, and reproductive health at Hopkins, and also the associate director of the Hopkins Population Center. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Mac. It is a great pleasure for me to be welcoming Kate Cagney to be speaking with us today from the University of Chicago, where she is a professor of sociology. She's the director of the Population Research Center, and she's also deputy dean of the Division of Social Sciences. So she's, she is very busy, and we're, we're very happy to have her time. Kate has a long and deep relationship to Chicago as a place and a university. She received her master's in public policy there before taking a small detour for a few years here to Baltimore to earn her PhD at Johns Hopkins in our School of Public Health. And I really think, I haven't asked her, but I think it, this is the time at which her interest in aging really sort of coalesced and took root in terms of influencing her research. After finishing her PhD here in Baltimore, she returned to Chicago as a faculty member where she has built upon the long Chicago tradition of neighborhood studies to expand theoretically, methodologically, and empirically the evidence base that informs our understanding of the relationships between place and health. And her work has encompassed national studies such as the National Social Life, Health and Aging Project, which is based at the University of Chicago, and also Chicago, a number of Chicago-based neighborhood studies like CHART, which she's going to talk about today, where she has really pioneered some of the real-time measurement of mobility to better understand the nature of neighborhood exposures and, and their relationship and effect on health. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Kate, to tell us all about your new work. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And it was a very generous introduction. And you are exactly right. I'm going to try to share my screen right now. But you're exactly right that my, what seeded my interest in aging was really um, fundamentally conversations about um, inequality. And I'm going to make sure I bring this screen up before I launch into more conversation. Um, can you see my screen, everyone? That worked? Great. Um, well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you today, even in this distal circumstance. And again, wanted to thank Emily for laying out uh, my interest in, in aging and neighborhood. And I did want to say that I, I came to Johns Hopkins after having worked at Harlem Hospital. And I was very interested in questions of inequality. And in one of my first meetings with Tom Levis, who I know has since left Johns Hopkins, I believe, right? Um, and is a dean now. Uh, but he had said, you know, if you're interested in inequality, then aging is where it is at. Because he said that is the manifestation of an unequal life course, uh, both in terms of health services availability, but also in thinking about life's opportunities and barriers. And so then I became more and more curious 
research on aging um, and then um, was delighted to um, have the mentorship um, of Emily, of Judy Casper, and others who helped me really think about the links uh, between uh, research on health and sociological discourse. And, and Emily in particular was really helpful in helping me think about those models. So um, with that, let me tell you about a new project, Activity Space, Social Interaction, and Health in Later Life. So I want to ask a, a broad question today, and that's what made it mean to take a place-informed approach to research on aging, uh, health, and the population sciences. And so that's sort of where we're going. More specifically, and I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Sorry, let me try this. Um, uh, we're we're going to review the underpinnings of research on place. And I want to spend some time now thinking about what I would consider the joy of data collection and new ways of capturing space. That has great import for social surveys and how they're structured. Uh, and it really has, I think, fundamental relevance for capturing what people think and feel. One of the things that um, I think is wonderful about opportunities related to found data and big data are thinking about like, how can we use the real estate of social surveys in a more inventive way because we're able to augment those data sources and to really make certain that we're assessing people's emotions and states. And so that's where I'm going to get when I talk about uh, approaches like ecological momentary assessment. So that's a bit of a teaser for that methodological piece, but really want to think about how to bring these together uh, to capture persons in context. So I, I've already told you sort of how I became interested in research on aging. Well, why do I think age is important? So clearly we have aging population, their policy and health consequences. I mentioned this notion of inequality and how right across the life course we may accrue different kinds of um, exposures and the accumulation of that, I've turned to the work of Angie O'Ran, um, does lead to this manifestation of disparate experiences. And I like thinking about the timing and sequencing of life events. I always love Mark Hayward's paper, thinking about the long arm of childhood. So really sort of, um, embracing this narrative of the life course. So why is place important? Well, we can think about place as being um, a circumstance in which resources are allocated. We think about health services and their uh, connections to place and social safety nets, and that can be sort of, you can think about county level, state level, think about resource availability that's adhered to place, and that can be either formal or informal. Place also sort of, uh, you know, reveals to us opportunities. Kristen Turney has a really nice paper in which she shows that you know, proximal others help with employment and attachment to the labor market, uh, and Becky Pettit's work on social engagement. I've always been fascinated, I think it was my coming back to Chicago and meeting Rob Sampson, thinking about this sense of belonging and connectedness that place gives us, this idea that you feel like your neighbors might have your back. That sort of uh, extends from this idea of self-efficacy and collective efficacy theory, and I'm gonna talk about that in detail. I also like thinking about space expansively, and so that's really the notion of this work. And so we think about um, neighborhood effects research uh, as sort of relying primarily on a residential location and I'll motivate that and I really want to understand exposure space more comprehensively. So I bring these two things together, aging place. So at the individual level, we think about health, location, connections, again, network ties, home ownership, the things that make us feel situated in place. I'm going to really think, like thinking about these meso-level circumstances, the contextual levels. So that can be age structure, the built and social environment. And I want to be attuned to segregation by place. I'm going to spend time in our sort of results period uh, thinking about how that segregation might matter for where people go during the day when they engage in routine activities. And I want to think about that related to race, class, and age. So I'm going to show you three depictions of our aging circumstance in the US context. And many of you know these data, but since I am so fascinated by age and aging, I wanted to share them. Um, we know, right, that our population 
is aging at a relatively rapid rate. The median age for adults in rural areas 51 as compared to 45 in urban. Um, and that, I, I, that data sort of flags my increasing interest in rural spaces, and I'll talk about that at the end. But by 2040, 25% of rural households would be 65 and over as compared to 20% of urban. I think it's important to be attentive, right? We're sort of looking at these state-based circumstances um, where we are seeing older populations cluster. But I, you know, I am increasingly interested though in sort of thinking about how this might matter on the ground. So this is Chicago and it's 77 community areas. It's our population composition for those 65 plus. And you can see, right, that uh, the outer ring of the city looks as if, right, that density of aged population is increasing. So uh, again, I stuck to 2000, 2016, and then wanted to show you that change. But we see that there's a fair amount of um, clustering and potentially age segregation in our city. Um, population pyramids will be familiar to demographers, but also because the theory that I draw on really thinks about the neighborhood space uh, and how people maneuver in it, I wanna think about age structure at the neighborhood level. This is our um, neighborhood of North Lawndale. It's on the west side. It shows you the change between 2000 again and 2016. You can see that it looks like that population, right, is shifting to an older age range, but also um, shrinking a bit. And if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about depopulation in Chicago and how that may be important for the kinds of questions we're asking related to activity space. So there are a number of disciplines I could draw on when I want to talk about the sort of frame of activity space. And you know, geography was central to the way we think about space and its measurement. And so it's been some work by Andrews recently in spatial gerontology. Also some great older work by Lawton on place attachment, evolution of the city by Ed Glazer, and then many of you I'm sure are familiar with Raj Chetty's work, you know, thinking about um, creating sort of this uh, a really a nice resource base of all these different kinds of measures uh, at the micro and macro level in urban context. Uh, anthropology, the experience of aging in place, social architecture, uh, urban planning. But it won't surprise you, given where I rest right now, I'm going to focus on theory and methods uh, used in sociology, draw on some of the turn of century work from the Chicago School of Sociology and its contemporary elaborations, but trying to think about how to extend that from what has been neighborhood effects research to what we characterize as, as an activity space approach. So in motivating that, I'll say that people in and across space in real time you know, tell us about, I think, the dynamism of the city. But there have been limitations in the characterization of that space, both the breadth and the depth. So again, kind of being attentive to the circumference of turf, the micro environment. And with new methodological approaches, how might they provide insight into what place is, how it's perceived, and how it matters for health, potentially how it could be modified for an aging population. So is there something informative from really understanding again, the characteristics of an older person's daily routine and how we then might be able to use that information to intervene. So we want to move beyond the residential neighborhood. I would argue that current approaches don't effectively assess exposure and access to resources and that residential neighborhood may really be a small part of your daily experience. We can think about, you know, census-based units and in, in much of the neighborhood-based research and Rob Sampson's work is a departure from this, but um, in, in some work, we will use sort of the aggregation of neighborhood-based characteristics modeled from the census track and then assign those to individuals. And so we could both think that they maybe aren't accurate in terms of the reflecting the individual characteristics. Um, but also, you know, how meaningful are census tracts in terms of, sort of how we maneuver in the city. And I think it's more compelling to think about where and how people spend time and that that may prove more valuable for understanding particularly access to health, well-being, um, and other kinds of care provision and services. So let me say a bit more about research on neighborhood effects and health. Uh, I, you know, theoretical approaches have 
largely indeed neglected actual spatial exposures beyond the residential address. And I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some new COVID related work um, I have toward the end of today's conversation, but exposure space of course, right, is very relevant for how we think about um, risk of uh, the virus. So setting that aside for a moment, what I wanna do now is integrate social disorganization theory and a social ecological approach in thinking about a conceptualization of individual level exposures as this activity space. But here I wanna emphasize two age and aging. So there's a story that our circumference of turf shrinks as we age. But actually we know little about those patterns. And, and as far as I've been able to ascertain from the literature, we don't actually have any data that tell us that people's lives shrink as we age. And again, life course theory Hermangi Oran and others suggest that lives differentiate as we age and people may constrict for a bit as they retire, but then lives may open up as they engage in other kinds of paid work or volunteer work or care for siblings or others in the community. Their lives may become much more expansive in all sorts of ways that we haven't been able to characterize. And so I wanna think about how neighborhoods are consequential but I want to also understand how that exposure space may vary. So we go back to old Chicago school theory, as I uh, flagged earlier, Sean McKay, Burgess and others suggested that neighborhood structural feel it, features like ethnic heterogeneity and economic structure, population composition, led to neighborhood based outcomes. And this glue is really the mechanisms thinking about connecting these structural features with particular kinds of individual and community level outcomes. Um, you know, we can think about what processes might link these. And so Casarda, right, this focus on social networks. I'm gonna talk at length about collective efficacy theory, um, social cohesion and informal social control. Again, how these create that glue. Uh, Skogan's work on disorder. William Julius Wilson on institutions, who I would also characterize as someone who helped us really think about this process turn in neighborhood-based research where we really did emphasize these mechanisms. Anderson's work on culture and Barbara Edwistle's more recent work thinking about population processes. So one of the things that's always been curious about neighborhood research is to try to think about how we sort what the effects are in the neighborhood of origin, that focal neighborhood with neighborhoods that are adjacent. And you know, I have colleagues at the University of Chicago, Luke Anslin and others who help us think about that adjacency statistically. So what might be the spillover effects from those neighbors? Mary Patillo also has some really nice work which she's thinking about you know, what difference it makes um, when a predominantly African-American neighborhood is surrounded by neighborhoods that may not be able to shore it up economically, even if it is middle class, comparing that with a white neighborhood of the same class composition, um, which is surrounded by other neighborhoods that buoy it. So we have theory both from quantitative and qualitative work that helps us think about that adjacency. Um, but one of the things that's a challenge is what do we do with that neighborhood, the neighborhood that's floating out there in space that may be important to uh, our residents in terms of where they spend time, um, how connected they are, but we haven't been able to incorporate it into our conceptualization of neighborhood influences. And I wanna give a shout out to the current graduate student, Liz Gomer, who's doing some work in the Bronx right now. And she interviewed residents to ask um, where their neighborhood was. And so she had them draw their homes and their neighborhoods and about half put their homes in the center and neighborhoods surrounding another 25%, you know, drew the neighborhood and then put their home in a particular quadrant, but fully 25% put their home in one place and their neighborhood in another, and they did not overlap. And so I think that's an interesting, um, you know, finding and also gives us kind of a sense that where we think about our connections and where we live our lives may not be where we sleep at night. I have to invoke Jane Jacobs here. If we were in a collective in which we were chatting right now, I might have asked all of you who was familiar with this picture. Um, the reason I, I draw on Jane for two reasons. One is that I think she has helped us understand how um, 
research on neighborhood context and how a street might be animated and how that might matter for connectedness and community. It's really a precursor to the way we think about collective efficacy theory. And I think she really helped set the stage for this. She was an architecture critic, community activist. For those of you who love the West Village, you have Jane Jacobs in large part to thank for organizing around um, a potential plan to put a highway through that community. And she was really one. I talked about neighbors having a sight line, again on the street um, and engaging in informal social control just through vis visual monitoring and what she describes as eyes on the street. I also like to invoke her for graduate students when you're thinking about preparing your dissertation and reading around and understanding sort of who can bring you insight, that insight can come from lots of different literatures. So let's incorporate Jane into this larger model where again, we can come from that sort of old Chicago school theory, segregation, poverty, residential instability, race, ethnic heterogeneity, that leads us to diversity and dispersion, clustering of organizations and amenities that again sort of moves us through this model where we're thinking about spatially and temporally distributed conventional street activity overlapping routines. I mentioned eyes on the street, which is what Jacobs is best known for. Mm. But again, she did, in her work, motivate this idea of a web of public trust and expectations of control on the street. And as I said, I think that's an important precursor to how we're thinking about collective efficacy theory and how that plays a role in the way we modified collective efficacy theory to capture the space you move through. And again, not just your residential space. So now I'm going to turn to what I mean when I say activity space and give you a definition. And I'm going to talk about a project um, currently funded by NIA and then um, a recent extension uh, through a rapid grant in NSF related to coronavirus work. And um, I, I should share too that what I have today are primarily descriptive findings, but I think um, motivate these ideas that really understanding activity space is central to how we might um, further understand health and its implications and other measures of well-being um, and then also how we might think about these sorts of methods in other kinds of contexts beyond the urban. So let me tell you about activity space social interaction and health trajectories in later life. This is our NIA study. Um, our research team is comprised of people from NORC, National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, who um, are engaged in our field effort with investigators from Ohio State and Cornell and other investigators at the University of Chicago. We've drawn heavily on our advisory board. I'm going to probably talk a little bit about Charlie Catlett's work. He, um, he is the PI of a project called Array of Things, which um, uh, entails 200 and a, a growing number of monitors in the city. And I'm going to show you one slide in which I link our activity space data to data from those environmental monitors. But we also, for our cognition work, draw on Ken Langa, Health Services, David Meltzer, um, Colombo Americatech to help us think about sampling, Rob Sampson to help us think about how we capture collective e efficacy in, uh, for these components we pass through and trust the semen on our biological measures. So, so this kind of give, this is a schematic that gives you a sense of what our larger uh, project looks like. We um, incorporate biomeasures, questions from about 45 minutes to one hour social survey at home. We ask um, behavioral questions in the home and also these on um, this general social environment. We do this at wave one, wave two, and wave three. We just finished wave three in November. Um, when we ask those sets of questions from this conventional social survey, we then um, hand people a phone. We can talk about this a little bit in the Q&A period about how we decided not to use an app in this context, um, but to actually program our own smartphone. Um, but what we do is then hand people that smartphone, we track them for one week at a time. So we now have three weeks of data. Um, that vary by season in the city of Chicago. For anybody who spent time here, you know that season matters a lot. Um, and while they're holding that phone and each day they are pinged five times a day 
with a technique called ecological momentary assessment that comes from the work of Chicxulub who is a psychologist. He spent many years at the University of Chicago, but helped us kind of differentiate oh, retrospective assessments that come in a conventional social survey with, um, with assessments that really are in the moment. So not did you feel pain in the last week, but are you in pain? And that that has important implications for um, you know, many different ways in which we would think about bringing in um, uh, respondent assessments of their state, but that I think for activities-based research is particularly compelling. And I'll show you some examples why I think that's the case. But these are the ways that we have, again, um, we follow people for a week at a time with GPS on that phone, we do EMAs on the phone, and we also we take their blood at each wave. And so we also have some biological markers in these data. And I won't show you analyses from those data today because they're not quite ready, um, but for those of you who might be interested in using these data at some point, I wanna make sure you know there are biomeasures there. So to briefly say, these are our key specific aims to conduct these in-person interviews and, and gather what kind of conventional social survey data, use that smartphone over a week period, get latitude, longitude, so we can situate people's emotional states geographically, that's at least one intent. And then we wanna leverage extant information. I mentioned the NSF Array of Things project. I'll show you again one example from those data but again, that's kind of with, um, you know, part of this larger mission to think about all the ways we may augment social survey and its data collection to think about capturing the richness of context. So these are our 10 Chicago neighborhoods for our study. So I'm only in the city of Chicago at this point, although um, I have plans to extend uh, this particular kind of method in rural uh, North Carolina and also in Hong Kong. Uh, but right now, the data that I'll share with you are in Chicago. We chose these 10 neighborhoods because they vary importantly by race and socioeconomic status. And so we chose the neighborhoods purposefully, and then we conducted um, uh, stratified random samples within those neighborhoods, but just so you can see that they vary um, in all of these important ways and that becomes important later when we think about the spaces that our respondents traverse. Uh, I mentioned ecological momentary assessment just to kind of give to ground that this is the way it works five beeps a day for seven days. Uh, the survey time window is a 30 minute window, 10 and 20 minute reminders. You can see sort of how those are bracketed across the course of the day. We did an incentive experiment at one point. We wanted to see if people would um, complete more if we paid them a dollar for each one or if we gave them five dollars on a threshold. That ended up being somewhat inconsequential. I thought people would really go for that dollar, but it turns out um, yeah, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that. Um, and I'll speak later about other ways that we might try to incentivize people to uh, complete more of those EMAs. One thing I just wanted to note, so this came from one of our focus groups and the respondent said, one of the funniest things is that I was at church when it pinged, but I had accidentally left it at home. She means the phone. So I got home and it had rung and I thought I was not home, I was at church. And I've been home a lot when it rang. So I got back in my car and I drove back to church. So these are one of the things that you learn through pilot work. That's one of the things you don't wanna have happen, right? You don't want people um, to <laughs> change their circumstance. And we also felt like this, this signal that people maybe didn't wanna reveal that they spent so much time alone. So that led us to alter the way that we ask questions about whether people um, we're on their own. So I'm going to just quickly, in the interest of time, run through what our screens look like. We ask about language, um, think about where you were when you were pinged um, at home, someone else is in transit. We have lots of different branches to the data collection, indoor, outdoor. Who were you with? We have a lot of measures of networks, and so we wanted to be able to characterize that. A number of people who are around, did you feel content, energetic? Again, this gets back to the fundamental high work of who you're with, how you're feeling, what you're doing, you know, these kind of basic descriptors. Um, we also kind of look inside the home context for older adults who spend a lot of time within the home. We want to make sure we capture that micro environment. Um, 
And so we applied some neighborhood-based theory to the inside of the house. And then this is the piece I think uh, and hope will remain innovative. Um, we use the EMA items to really kind of get at the vibe on the street. So Rob helped us think about some that had more of a positive arc, people smiling, nodding, saying hello, groups of people socializing, talking, um, people helping each other. But it's really the application of collective efficacy theory to places one passes through, observations of their pro-social activity. So we really think of collective efficacy theory, collective efficacy theory as that mechanism, again, back on our model, linking structure to outcome, that again is the glue. And we think about that as being social cohesion and informal social control, this idea that people in your neighborhood have your back. Um, and we think that we, and re respondents can, pick up on that vibe as they pass through the space. So it's just a quick, um, Reminder to tell you that there were lots of ways in which we modified from wave one to wave two and even wave two to wave three, increasing the font size, making it easier to see on the phone. We added images and other things to make the EMAs more fun to fill out. There was a lot we learned along the way and I'm happy in the Q&A to talk about sort of what worked and what didn't from a field perspective. So right now, I am going to turn to some of our results, and then I'm gonna just briefly describe what we're doing um, that will draw out uh, the COVID experience right now. So I'm gonna show you one slide from our baseline data, six from the data that are GPS driven, and three from the ecological momentary assessment data. So remembering again that we have all of these data sources that come in, um, to our analysis. So this is just one slide to show you that uh, we asked um, our respondents, this comes from the collective efficacy battery, just this one question, but we asked the entire set, people in this neighborhood can be trusted. So these are our 10 neighborhoods. And um, again, they were purposefully chosen to maximize variation on race and class. And you'll see, we see a lot of variation where agree is that brighter red strip. And so that sort of gave us some confidence that um, we chose neighborhoods that also had important variation in some of the key elements we wanted to explore. And these are our 10 neighborhoods. These data are from wave one. I have the names of the 10 neighborhoods on the bottom, but um, as one colleague of mine pointed out, um, not everyone knows these Chicago neighborhoods, so I put codes on the top so that you know that it's primarily um, an African-American higher income neighborhood or a Latino middle income neighborhood. Um, and these data right, just show where our respondents were um, during the course of one week. But one of the things that struck us is that if you look at a place like North Center, white higher income, residents appear to be going north and to Wisconsin and maybe a bit to the suburbs to engage in routine activities. If you look um, at communities like um, Fuller Park, which are African-American lower income, primarily those residents seem to be going south to Indiana um, and less so in the suburban context. So one of the things that's suggested to us, um, and we'll look now at, um, at those data just by race group that we see this is African Americans, Latinos, uh, and white respondents, that it seems like right, people are gravitating towards same race neighborhoods. And there's some evidence, and we actually, this from an associated study, but it looks like for instance, for, for um, some respondents in our Woodlawn neighborhood, which is primarily African American, they may bypass Hyde Park, which is a relatively amenity-rich neighborhood and integrated to end up in a neighborhood that has approximately the same racial composition, such as Englewood or North Lawndale that we looked at earlier. So we're curious about that hopscotching and what it means, and that's one of the things we want to draw out in our uh, analyses as we move forward. So I'm going to show you here um, this is the measure of the span of activity space. So we just looked at where people ended up, just geolocating them, uh, but we're very interested in the extent to which, for instance, it looks like our African-American respondents have a smaller standard deviation ellipse, a tighter space for their circumference of turf than particularly their white counterparts, but even their Latino members, they're kind of two key 
neighborhoods um, in Chicago, uh, particularly on the far south side, that's sort of a new immigrant community, more established community around Pilsen and Little Village. It looked like there was a lot of moving back and forth between those two areas in particular, which I think expanded um, what we see for the Latinos here. Um, this is also true for, you know, non-home tracks visited. So again, you know, getting in another sense of the expansiveness of people's spaces, it looks like for our African African American respondents, it's a bit tighter. The last thing I want to point out on this slide is really this role of education. So it looks like as right, there's kind of a graded function in terms of educational attainment, whereas education increases, we see um, people's um, activity spaces expand. And this is a flag. One of the things we're very interested in, this comes back to Jane Jacobs, is this idea of whether um, street activity suppresses crime rates. And so what we're trying to do here is just an illustrative example, hmm, is to look at the extent to which street activity in June might affect July crime rates. It's like there's a slight suggestion here, again, just descriptive at the moment, but we're, we're continuing with this analysis. And this is led by my graduate student, Leanne Kai. Um, I'm now moving into, so that kind of closes just relying on geolocating people. And now we're geolocating people and we are showing um, what they are expressing in the spaces where they rest. And again, this is just um, kind of a, a, a helpful graphic to help me explain to you um, what kinds of data we're getting. So you'll see, um, we decided to draw out fear here. So this is the, again, the ecological momentary assessment outcomes. We have low fear, medium fear, and high fear. And um, we can see that some respondents, um, respondent who reports medium fear doesn't feel like she's in a close-knit neighborhood. Someone would help though. Yes, she thinks not alone, number of people around three or four, maybe know a few of them. So I just, I shared this slide just so you can see the richness of these EMA data that they characterize the context again, that people are resting in, that they're passing through. And you'll see that even in this clustered space, people over time in the day might report very different levels of fear or might report fear for very different kinds of reasons at the same time of day. And these are EMA data. And I wanna show you two pieces here on this slide. One um, is, and this is just based on 505 EMA observations for people who found themselves outdoors when they were pinged. So, you know, because the outdoor space gives us a little more opportunity to draw from respondents in terms of the kinds of things they're observing, I um, want to show you here that our African American respondents were more likely to find themselves in a high poverty space when they were outdoors and in public spaces. I'm going to link that to some of our COVID work in a moment. And then, um, our white respondents were more likely to report that they were felt high social cohesion in these places they passed through. So in this slide, I just want to show you that there's a, some nice variation in how these EMA instances of self-reported stress, um, uh, you know, kick in by location. So. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting that people feel more stress at work and certainly stress at the doctor's office. Um, restaurants much lower, shopping lower, but that there, again, it's kind of some nice variation to draw out for those of you who might want to look at these EMA data, but also was interesting, quite see this here, but you can from the standard deviation, that home was a place where people either reported very low levels of stress or very high. So those are, um, kind of, you know, in a very quick snapshot, some of the data we have right now from our three waves where we both have GPS data, EMA data, remember we have those baseline survey data, um, and then uh, we have, you know, our biomeasure data. So a rich source from a variety um, of, of kinds of uh, data types. And so we're excited to really dig in and do analyses, but sort of, you know, at the turn of COVID and we had just been in the field in November, as I stated, we decided we should uh, apply for an NSF rapid because space is so central to contagion. 
And we really wanted to bring social science perspectives and approaches to how we're thinking about those levels of contagion. So for the rapid, we've argued that lower income, racial ethnic minorities, and those in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods may exhibit these routine patterns of exposure to more crowded, higher risk locations. So this difference in social environments, activities, social integration, and we kind of trying to draw out that context. Uh, respondents may engage in leisure activities in free public spaces more readily that are denser, malls or parks, rely on crowded discount shopping destinations, for instance, a Walmart, in the absence of neighborhood grocery stores or delivery, depend more readily on public transportation. And, you know, for a sub subset of our respondents, at least, continuing working beyond typical retirement age, many in face-to-face -face service sector jobs. So those are the kinds of things we wanted to draw out to understand, again, the context of COVID. And particularly when we're thinking about race and ethnic differences in the way that COVID has emerged. So in Illinois, for instance, you know, approximately 13 to 14% of our population is African American, but about 34% of our deaths. In Michigan, 14% of the population uh, is African American, 41% of their deaths come from that population. So these are significant disparities but the arguments have really relied on individual level factors, pre-existing conditions, diabetes, obesity, other kinds of ailments. Um, but we don't want people to lose sight that some of the drivers of those conditions and the drivers of being in a high risk environment are shared and come from these um, contextual kinds of characteristics. So, um, so how are we incorporating COVID related work? Um, we're, we're in the field right now, so we're assessing during and after the pandemic. Did an intake survey over the phone. We're doing GPS tracking right now, and EMA is on that phone. We sterilized and mailed the phone to a subset of our respondents, um, about 150 of those. Um, we ask about COVID experience for self and others, COVID precautions and behaviors, social interactions, and essentially your ability to really comply with sheltering in place orders um, and how that might work for you or not, and whether or not, for instance, you are in the labor market, so you are meeting uh, the public day to day, and neighborhood perceptions, how the neighborhood itself, so again, drawing on collective efficacy theory, how the neighborhood itself um, was able to respond. So while we were in the field, of course, um, uh, the Floyd murder occurred, and um, there were significant protests in many of our neighborhoods uh, where our respondents um, reside. And so we now have incorporated a set of questions on street activity, police action, and how neighborhood perceptions and the responsiveness of the neighborhood to the protests um, can also be sort of accommodated and the way in which we wanted to be able to capture that too. So the COVID response and the protest response, again, drawing from this collective efficacy frame. So I am, I'm gonna truly close in one minute because I'm really interested in a conversation with you, but just wanted to, because I've already flagged array of things, show you what our device looks like. You can see it in the middle there. Um, and one of the things this has allowed us to do with our study, with our activity space study, is to be able to connect to another form of environmental data. And so, I will show you because I love this project. And this comes out of Argonne National Labs for all the great things that it taps. And just so you know, you know, the EPA has three air monitors uh, in the city of Chicago and Cook County more broadly. And we have 200 of these in the city. Um, they also have a, a camera in them. And we can talk about this more in the Q&A, but they take a sweep of the block and then code those data. And that, um, in the spirit of William White, gives us information about street activity again. Back to Jane Jacobs, back to this idea that an animated street is protective, health enhancing, pro-social in lots of different ways. So we were able to uh, connect these data. And this just shows you quickly um, that as our respondents move around in space, um, they are exposed to various levels of carbon monoxide throughout the day. So again, it's not just where they sleep at night, but what happens to them during the day that's consequential. Um, 
I will close then by just the last thing I want to say is that I have a project underway with Joe Hotz. I know he's known to many of you and Bill Copeland from the University of Vermont, thinking about applying collective efficacy theory in rural areas and EMA use in the labor market. So great extensions to this work, I hope. Um, and, you know, again, I guess the last thing I'll say is one of the ways I'd love to see this um, be expanded to is to think about virtual places. Here we are now in this virtual kind of connection. What's the richness of it? What are its limitations? How might we um, in some way develop it so that we can continue to have the kinds of social um, connections and form of social integration that is health enhancing? And I'll close. Great, thank you. Um, that was a, a very interesting presentation. I uh, want to get right into questions. Um, so we have one from Jacqueline Carmichael, who I will unmute right now. Um, uh, who has a question about the field of interior design. Hmm. Um, having some trouble here. Um, so her, her question or comment was about um, how aging inhabitants engage in their spatial built environment and how that um, relates to um, uh, this year study. So sort of how older adults get out and about, is that kind of the... I think this is more about um, their, their home and ah. how, how the, the context of um, sort of their, their, the built environment of their home um, within all of this. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. It's one of the reasons um, we ended up getting a lot of measures, um, again, kind of applying it. Sorry about that. Um, neighborhood theory to help us think about how we might characterize the internal space. So we ask um, about physical and what we would consider social disorder inside the household. So one of the things I think we will be able to characterize at least in this study is, you know, whether there is a way in which the home may be creating a barrier of sorts to social network integration. And um, Erin York Cornwell, who's at Cornell University, is really leading that effort. And that came from her early dissertation work in which she wanted to understand more of the context of the household. You know, and that can come from, you know, she had an outcome related to risk of falls, but also really this idea that people can kind of, um, you know, create a more sort of bounded and again, uninviting kind of space. And we, you know, we can imagine that there's a, you know, feedback mechanism there. If they aren't able to create an inviting space, then nobody comes in, then that only exacerbates their social isolation. Great, thank you. Uh, now I have a question from Thomas Cujo, uh, who I've unmuted, finally figured that out. So Thomas, if you wanna <laughs> ask your question about, uh, life in congregate settings. Yeah, I'm just curious if there's any special considerations for uh, in your study for individuals uh, who live in congregate settings and if that may impact, impact collective efficacy in any way. Yeah, so we are, so we don't, you know, one of the things that, you know, in a, in a social survey of this form, we do the best we can to get into circumstances that might be assisted living, but anything that kind of moves, anything that's sort of um, a step down circumstance or nursing home kind of environment, we can't uh, get into, into those spaces to interview respondents. Um, but in the spaces, I think it's a great question. We haven't looked at that separately, although we have been attentive to whether people are multi-unit buildings and whether there's a way, you know, there's a sort of long literature on whether sort of being in close social space in that way is more alienating <laughs> or creates more social connection. And that's one of the things we want to be able to examine both in, in a context of a regular time period, but also related to COVID, because that's something we've discussed, just the density of building space itself. Thank you. Great. Appreciate uh, 
now I have a question from uh, S. Becker about um, individual versus uh, social units. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, I may have missed it at the beginning, but uh, you're sampling individuals, I guess. So if I go to a church with my wife, then uh, that's uh, noted one of the questions you ask, but you're not really treating us as a unit. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, account for that in your analyses? Thank you. You're right. I know we treat you as so you are our respondent, but we want to understand how our respondent is nested both sort of in a social network space. Um, so that can be in the dyad. It can be, you know, a larger group. We also want to, you know, when people are out and about, understand kind of the context on the street. So how many people might be around them. Um, but in our analyses right now, we would just treat those other kinds of characteristics as covariates, but it's the respondent that's him or herself that is um, uh, the focal unit of analysis. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Erica Hornstein about um, some of the technology that you used. So Erica, you're unmuted. Hi, yeah, you had mentioned that you had um, programmed the iPhone specific for the project, and I was just curious if uh, how exactly you did that and if you had considered using an Apple Watch um, as a more like natural tracker of movements. Yeah, those are great questions. And you know, so we really, it's, it's interesting how quickly the field changes and what's possible and what isn't. We ended up not using individuals' phones, but mailing them phones. Um, we did that because um, in our focus group work um, and in our pilots, some of the respondents suggested they felt uncomfortable putting an app on a phone they already had. And given also the composition of our sample, a number of older adults didn't have a phone at all. And so we wanted to be able to provide that phone. We thought about things um, like Apple Watches. Um, you know, one, one problem with those, is just the, you know, being able to look at them and read them for an older adult population. Um, you, I mentioned briefly that through wave one and wave two, we changed our font size to make it more accommodating for those who might have challenges related to sight. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it really was about that kind of um, challenge related to be actually being able to see the EMA. You know, the other issue too, and this is something we're thinking about in the future, and in the project I mentioned with Joe Hotz, we're actually putting apps on phones um, because it's a hassle sometimes to carry two phones then for a week. And you want to make sure people aren't leaving our phone at home. So we're always looking for modifications. You know, what, and you know, we had some, we wanted to kind of keep the, you know, the you know the kind of method the same in terms of how the data then were uploaded to NORC that's not such an interesting point but um, but it does relate to security and we only had one instance where one respondent's kid hacked our phone and called Denmark um, but it's the only it's the only situation in which we had um, difficulty with the phones we owned. Uh, so next we're going to go to Amy Sue who has a, a couple of questions. Uh, Amy, you're unmuted. Hi, Kate. Um, thanks Hi. for sharing your study. <laughs> Sorry you didn't make it to Baltimore because I remember sure. we often talked about you actually getting here physically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so my question was that I don't think of 65 and older individuals as being very mobile mm -hmm. and more stay at home. And I was wondering if your study allowed participants to report they were either asleep at the time they were pinged or and also, what if their activity, it, whether or not their activity space um, is uh, enhanced at all by being on the internet or having connectivity through like phone, Kindles, and so forth? Because I think of activity space now is not just physical or movement, but also that type of mental, intellectual engagement. Um, and lastly, where. Where do you think your findings are going in terms of health outcomes for aged individuals? Yeah, so um, so speaking first about just, so I'm gonna kind of break this down into three parts. The first is just thinking about um, our older adults and yeah, a, a fair number of people spend a fair amount of week at home. And it's one reason why we wanted to get the interior of the home environment and these measures of uh, connectedness in the home and disorder or order in the home. Um, we also ask 
if they're in the home to report on the external space outside. So we're still getting some kind of interesting variation on what's going on inside or outside, even if the home is their focal space. Uh, because we wanted to recognize that people may be more situated in their neighborhoods and environments. You know, that said, we are still seeing some really interesting variation in where, and you can even kind of see it from the maps, where people end up during the course of the week. But we did want to be attentive to that. Um, on the piece, you know, related to, and that's one reason I raised the point on virtual spaces at the end, we get a little bit on that, not enough, I think. And I do think with this kind of, social turn related to COVID and the extent to which people have had to be inventive about connectivity, it's gonna be just imperative that we assess that moving forward. It has been in the past, we didn't, we didn't allocate enough time to how people are managing their social connections in virtual space, um, but we are doing that now in our, what kind, we're kind of considering our COVID wave, which is really sort of a fourth wave of this study, but in whatever work we do moving forward. Um, and then what are we finding related to health? So we haven't done as much on the analysis of, we spent a lot of time looking at, at race. Um, broadly though, you know, these are things you would not um, find surprising. You know, people who are moving around more would seem to report better emotional well-being, um, better functional status. We don't have the um, blood work uh, assayed yet, and so I'm not able to speak to some things like um, Epstein-Barr or cortisol. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, a question from Ting Sang right here, and I think we have time for one more question after this. So enter in the, that in the chat box if you would like. Uh, sorry, I just, there you go. Okay, thank you so, so much for the wonderful study. We very much enjoy that. My quick question is following up with, uh, with the previous two. You mentioned some, a lot of people are not, uh, um, you know, feel it's a trouble to carry two phones, right? So which mm -hmm. means they might not be willing to carry that with them. And also, you also mentioned a lot of those 65 and above people, they might not be used to the phone generation, lot. like we always carry a phone. Feel, feel without a phone, we cannot live, right? But many of those people do not. So how do you overcome the difficulty? A lot of them do not actually use the phone as you wanted them to, to do, because that will invalidate the, the GPS data if that's the case, right? Yes. <laughs> I know. Those are all the worries we had. I mean, partly, and I could spend a lot of time talking about this, and if anyone's interested in these kinds of methods, I'm also happy to set up a Zoom meeting and also with our NORC field team. You know, this comes from the magic of having really experienced interviewers who sit down with respondents, show them how, um, you know, how the GPS works, show them what the EMA images are when they come up, show them how to use that, and then they're available for questions. And we found, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but we found mostly that, you know, when, when the connection between the interviewer and respondents seemed stable, um, and people felt comfortable drawing on, you know, the adherence to the EMAs was just higher. I mean, that makes sense on the face of it, but it's interesting to see, of course, your data are only as good as your field team, um, but we were thrilled to have an excellent, very experienced field team who had the patience to really sort of walk people through. And I, you know, I do think there, you know, for many of our respondents, there was a curiosity when they didn't have um, this kind of technology already in their homes. Great, and uh, for our last question, closing out the hour here, we'll go back to uh, uh, Thomas Cujo. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could discuss the policy implications for your work. Yeah, that is a great question. I, you know, I think one of the things um, that's could that is important from this is, you know, there are just so many levels, and so now I feel like I want to launch into all. <laughs> and I know we're at the end, but, but, um, you know, let's think about it in relationship to COVID. We would know kind of in a community, um, you know, who is socially isolated and who is not. Um, are there ways to think about uh, using these data to inform what are the things that draw people out of their home environments? You know, I, I think on the face of it, and you know, what we learned from analyses many years ago in the Chicago heat waves, people who are socially isolated in socially isolated neighborhoods, so that kind of nested isolation, are at a particular disadvantage. And thinking about the ways that we can animate a neighborhood to make certain that we both 
know who might be at risk, but that there is a certain, you know, way in which we can, you know, this kind of goes back to this kind of fundamental question, how do you create social capital and community? And it is the creating social capital and community that leads to the interventions that are, you know, and can be particularly attuned to people who um, have difficulty getting out of their homes for many different sorts of reasons. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm interested if we can just have a quick exchange. What are the kinds of things that you think from a policy perspective might be drawn from these data? Yeah, I think, um, as you mentioned, social isolation is pretty critical. And, and I think uh, about uh, Aaron Kleinen's very new work yeah. on palaces uh, for the people in terms of uh, supporting the infrastructure is critically important. I, I think uh, there's, there's intersections with what's going on now in our country in regards to uh, you know, the uh, race discussion and how social connections and uh, yeah. In interactions between different groups are, are critically important for uh, for progress. So, um, you know, how do you do this? How do we uh, uh, broach it? I, I think it's an area of, uh, prime for further discussion and research. I think that's. Oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something else? No, ma'am. No, I, you know, actually was on a conversation yesterday and part of the discussion was about the protests in Chicago and policing. And I would argue that, you know, the communities that were more effective in responding to COVID in, are more effective in responding to the needs of older adults and more effective in having conversations about policing in their neighborhoods. And so I do feel like, you know, this kind of connectedness creates a reservoir that's important for lots of different kinds of outcomes. And because you just mentioned the heat wave piece, you know, one of the things we found many years ago was that, you know, people were much more likely um, to die in neighborhoods that didn't have uh, a commercial infrastructure, a commercial strip. And so, um, again, I think it gets back to some of those fundamental insights that um, Jane Jacobs had about, you know, what are the kinds of local destinations that, cr that create connectivity just through this engagement in routine activities and that those have important spillover effects for our most vulnerable. Great, thank you. Uh, well, to close things out, uh, Ling Shin, I don't know if you, did you have a question? I wanted to give you the opportunity since um, uh, you're, um, the whole reason that this seminar happened in the first place. Oh my, so. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so nice to have you here and actually hope you actually help us with the P2C <laughs> application too. Sure. Uh, but I have actually it's a concrete question about your talk. It's very, very interesting, you know, study. We know that, you know, Chicago has a great tradition and you carry that on to such a exciting uh, uh, direction. One specific question is about the health condition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Amy asked about the health yeah. outcome. I am asking about the health conditions. And we're talking about health conditions are so mm -hmm. closely related to today, you know, COVID 19's uh, outcomes as well. I'm more interested in the cognitive ability of a, you know, older adults mm -hmm. because of their cognitive ability will constrain the, you know, uh, uh, yeah, this virtual world, how you command this virtual world, so much to do with, uh, with your, you know, uh, cognitive ability. Do, do you right. have any thinking about how to get data of those? I know it's very, very difficult to do the assessment and to get those. Maybe use um, administrative data, use EHR, and other things that to inform your um, respondents. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> it's a hard and such an interesting question because, you know, one of the things we want to understand um, is, uh, it, you know, how are people operating in community? And, you know, one of the, you know, there is, of course, selection that people who are severely cognitively disabled won't be in our sample, both because they won't be community dwelling, but they also wouldn't be, you know, feel comfortable using the EMA. Circumstance now when that happened and so we might be able to do a little comparison there when when that happened We asked that we could just track that respondents with GPS 
So we chose to, to keep the sample fuller and more diverse at the expense of some EMA data because we wanted to be able to look at questions like your own. The one thing, you know, so Seth Sanders, um, who's now at Cornell University, had this really nice idea of using um, keystroke data to look at a precursor to cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. Um, in some of the data collection efforts he was engaged in. And I thought, oh, you know, there's a way in which, so we had a little conversation with Seth at one point, but a way in which we could think about how, how quickly, for those who do use the EMA, how quickly they're able to complete the EMA and whether that tracks with other kinds of health decrements. So kind of motivated by Seth and his keystroke idea. So that's one way, it doesn't completely capture you know, the enormity of, the, of your <laughs> question, but, but two, two ways to think about it for these data. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Well, um, unless there are any other questions, uh, we'll close things out here and I'll just say that um, uh, we've recorded um, this whole session, so we'll, we'll post it um, on our website later and email that link out to everybody. Uh, so feel free to share that with um, any colleagues who wanted to make it today but, but weren't able to. Um, but uh, thanks, Professor Cagney, for um, still being able to do this given the circumstances and it's, uh, your research is uh, increasingly relevant. Yes, and I hope we will get to the place, you know, as we continue to analyze this data where we're able to um, look at the effects of uh, on health over time and also think about the important questions related to informing interventions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.